very issue which is of topical relevance. It is an issue of topical relevance also for the fact that even as I speak, right at this moment, over the next one or two months, we are expecting that two issues will come before the Honorable Appellate Division for consideration. One, which relates to the 16th Amendment of the Constitution, which has been declared illegal by the Honorable High Court Division, the, which concerns the uh, uh, amendment to the Constitution which removed the provision for Supreme Judicial Council and introduced or rather restored the provision for impeachment of the judges of the Honorable High Court Division for uh, Honorable Supreme Court of Bangladesh for allegations of misconduct to the uh, Parliament. That has been declared illegal by the Honorable High Court Division and at the moment that is the subject matter of a pending appeal before the Honorable Appellate Division. The other matter, which will also come up for consideration over the next one or two months, is the, with respect to the uh, non-confirmation of additional judges of the High Court Division who have not been confirmed as judges of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh by the government, despite the fact that the uh, Honorable Chief Justice had recommended their confirmation. Now, these are sensitive issues, but I believe it is also appropriate that in a democratic society, in a pluralistic society, these matters should be the subject matter of dispassionate discussion and objective analysis and constructive debate. And it is in that vein that uh, I hope that the participants in today's uh, discussion, which will follow the lecture, will uh, make their contribution to today's discussion. So without further ado, may I welcome Mr. Justice Sheikh Hassan Arif to take the podium and deliver his lecture. Thank you very much. Um, as Mr. Mustafi said, the issue is in fact a sensitive one. And no one can speak on this issue for long without touching some controversial issues. Still, I have tried my best to avoid the issues which are pending before the Appellate Division and also the issues on which there are tremendous controversy amongst us. Uh, therefore, I have prepared a written lecture, in fact. I need to stand. Okay. Okay, I'm trying my best. That's why I have prepared a draft of my lecture just to make sure that I'm avoiding those controversies. Still, I fear I might touch some controversial issues, which I tried my best to avoid, but I could not. In a legal system under democracy, judges play a very important role in defending constitution, legal values, and in dispensing justice. When the citizens or persons cannot resolve disputes themselves amicably or through arbitration, they normally take recourse to adjudication of judicial of dispute resolution through process of court. In such adjudication process, judges are empowered by the constitution and law. Thank you. In such adjudication, therefore, practically, they become demigod. In the words of Montesquieu, constant experience has shown us that every man invested with power is apt to abuse it and to carry his authority until he is confronted with limits. After all, power alone can be antidote to power. Therefore, the question arises, the judges being human beings, if they do mistakes, illegality, or get themselves involved in criminal activities like taking bribes or committing corruption, nepotism, etc., who will judge them? And how or to what extent they should be judged, judged, prosecuted, or proceeded against? The international instruments on such accountability of judges recognize that not only the individual judges should be held accountable for their performance, violation of human rights, or commission of illegality, the state should also have responsibility to ensure such accountability of judges. The International Commission of Jurists, through its different consultation papers, have in the meantime recognized that through its a holistic and preventive approach to corruption, 
and to impunity of judges for human rights violation is important. According to them, the measures ensuring accountability of judiciary or judges are unlikely to succeed if they are not matched by similar efforts to address corruption and abuses by other governmental or non-governmental actors. However, this absence of initiatives to address other institutions' corruption cannot be or should not be used as an excuse for the judiciary for its failure to adopt measures for prevention of corruption and criminality within its own sector. In view of the prevailing corruption picture at almost every governmental and non-governmental institutions, this approach of adopting measures for correcting the criminality of judges as well as the officials of other governmental organizations are very much important in Bangladesh. Sources in international law to ensure judicial accountability. Almost all international legal instruments on human rights, criminal law, rule of law, or the administration of justice and corruption include an obligation of states to ensure access to a competent, independent, and impartial and accountable judiciary. The preamble to the UN Human Rights Council resolution on independence and impartiality of the judiciary, jurors, and assessors, and the independence of lawyers, most recently adopted in 2015, the following paragraph, stressing the importance of ensuring accountability, transparency, and integrity in the judiciary is an essential element of judicial independence and a concept inherent to the rule of law when it is implemented in line with the UN basic principles on independence of the judiciary and other relevant human rights norms, principles, and standards. Article 14 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and Article 10 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights have clearly recognized the right of everyone to a fair and public hearing through a competent, independent, and impartial tribunal established by law in all criminal and civil litigations. In this regard, Article 11.1 of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption is very much pertinent to be mentioned here. Bearing in mind the independence of the judiciary and its crucial role in combating corruption, each state party shall, in accordance with the fundamental principles of its legal system and without prejudice to the judicial independence, take measures to strengthen integrity and to prevent opportunities for corruption among members of the judiciary. Such measures may include rules with respect to the conduct of members of the judiciary. In two th the 2015 Implementation Guide and Evaluative Framework for Article 11, as published by the Uni United Nations Office on Drugs and Crimes, advocated for practical tools to assist the judiciary and other government officials, as well as academics, the media, the society, civil society, to evaluate the state's implementation of Article 8, Artic Article 11, sorry. Sources of judicial accountability in our national law. The superintendents and control of lower judiciary and tribunals of this country has invested in the High Court Division of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh under Article 109 of the Constitution. However, even with the formal separation of judiciary from executive organ, pursuant to Mazdar Hussain case, complete supervision of the lower judiciary, as mandated by the Constitution, is still a far cry, given that some major areas of such supervision and control are still governed by the executives. Frustration recently expressed by the Honorable Chief Justice regarding dual administration of the lower judiciary bears testimony to it. Besides, Article 96 of the Constitution has made provisions for removal of judges of the Supreme Court by the Honorable President on the basis of finding by the Supreme Judicial Council that the judge has become incapable of properly perf performing the functions of his office or that he has been guilty of gross misconduct. While a judge can be removed on the finding of gross misconduct committed by him, the Constitution is silent about minor misconducts, unbecoming behavior, or to deal with the slow judges, too fast judges, talkative judges, sleeping judges, judges snoring on the bench, rude judges, and the judges who do not release judgments within reasonable time. While a single dishonest judge jeopardizes the integrity of the entire judicial system, an incompetent, dull, or lazy judge can also cause irreparable damage to the judiciary. Therefore, I advocate for the provisions either in the Constitution or law to deal with such situation. Conducts or behaviors of judges for which 
accountability is required. I have addressed only one or two issues here. That issue is very large. One is violation of human rights, and another is criminality, corruption in the judiciary. From the perspective of violation of human rights by judges, from the perspective of international law, the acts of judicial officials constitute an act of the state just as for any other state official. Therefore, the judges are also capable, like any other kind of public officials, of perpetrating or being complicit in violations of international human rights. Such violations of human rights by judges put the state in the dock and accused before the international community. The examples of such violations of human rights perpetrated by the judges include arbitrary sentencing of persons to imprisonment or death, convicting persons of criminal offenses, or imposing penalties through trials that have substantially failed to satisfy fundamental guarantees of fairness, authorizing arbitrary or unlawful interference with individuals' privacy. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Justice Kamul Islam Siddiqui. Privacy, family, home, or correspondence, etc. Such violations by judges may also include allowing genocide, complicit in forced disappearances of individuals, etc., which are sometimes noticed in developing countries like Bangladesh. Willfully depriving a protected person of the right of fair and regular trial, for instance, is expressly listed in the 1949 Geneva Convention and 1977 Additional Protocol as a grave breach giving rise to criminal responsibility and is included as a war crime within the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court under the Roman Statute. Now, the corruption in judiciary. There is no specifically universally agreed definition of corruption. The special rapporteur of United Nations on the independence of judges and lawyers has cited the informal definition used by Transparency International, the leading international anti-corruption NGO, which is the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. According to the said UN report here, judicial corruption erodes the principles of independence, partiality, and integrity of the judiciary, infringes on the rights to a fair trial, creates obstacles to the effective and efficient administration of justice, and undermines the credibility of the entire justice system. The UN Convention Against Corruption does not directly define corruption or integrity in relation to judges under Article 11. It requires to criminalize a series of specific acts that are implicitly treated as forms of corruption, such as bribery, embezzlement, misappropriation, or other diversion of property by public officials or judges. judges. According to the International Commission of Jurists on Policy Framework for Preventing and Eliminating Corruption and Ensuring the Impartiality of the Judicial System, the judicial system is corrupted when any act of omission results or is intended to result in the loss of impartiality of the judiciary. Generally, corruption in our social contacts occurs when a judge or court officer seeks or receives a benefit of any kind or promise or benefit of any kind in respect of exercise of power or other actions. Such acts usually constitute criminal offenses under national law, as for example, bribery, fraud, utilization of public resources for private gain, deliberate loss of court records, and deliberate alteration of court records. Corruption also occurs when a case decided not on the basis of evidence of law, but on the basis of improper influences, inducements, pressures, threats from any quarter, and which also include a conflict of interests, nepotism, favoritism to friends, consideration of promotional prospects, consideration of post-retirement placements, improper socialization with members of the legal profession, the executive or the legislature, socialization with the litigants or prospective litigants, predetermination of an issue involved in the litigation, prejudice, having regard to the power of government or political parties. The general term judicial integrity is often understood in light of the Bangalore principles of judicial conduct, which is adopted by the judicial group on strengthening judicial integrity, called Judicial Integrity Group, a group of chief justices and Supreme Court judges from around the world, which have subsequently been repeatedly endorsed by the United Nations bodies. Now the question is, accountable to whom? to whom the judges should be held to be accountable. Generally, the judiciary being an institution under the law and constitution, 
is accountable to the society itself. However, that doesn't mean that a judge will be bound to adopt those decisions with which a majority of society may agree, nor should an individual judge be at any risk of removal or punishment simply because a majority of society may disagree with his particular judgment. Therefore, the judiciary or the judges are in fact accountable to law, and that accountability is ensured in terms of a merit of a case when they explain the decisions based on the application of legal rules through legal reasoning and findings of facts that are based on evidence and analysis. And their decisions can be reviewed and, if necessary, corrected by the judicial hierarchy through a system of appeals. The opinion of society in respect of a particular issue is only relevant when such opinion is expressed through a duly enacted law of the state or international legal obligations of the state. Now, different forms for ensuring accountability of judges. Article 8 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights provides that the victims of human rights violations, either by direct or indirect of act of the judges, have the right to an effective remedy and reparation for the violations which is no less applicable to violation perpetrated or with complicity of judicial officials than for other officials of the state. The UN Convention Against Corruption also guarantees such rights of the victims to bring legal proceedings for compensation against the state for any violation of human rights committed by the judge either directly or with complicity. Such elements of adequate and effective reparation under international law include restitution, that is restoring the victim to the original situation, compensation for the economically accessible damages, rehabilitation, guarantee of non-repetition of violations, etc. In that respect, state is responsible for all acts and omissions of judicial officials that are carried out in the judge's judicial capacity, and state shall take measures for effecting proceedings against the judges through a judicial council or similar body which is independent of executive and legislature. Removal from office, disciplinary sanctions, and other administrative measures are also internationally accepted measures for ensuring accountability of judges for their misconduct. However, according to Article 17 to 20 of the UN Basic Principles for Independence of Judiciary, a judge should only be subjected to disciplinary proceedings and penalties up to removal from office for sufficiently serious misconduct. It may be noted, however, that the Bangladesh Constitution under Article 96 provides for removal of judges of the Supreme Court only on finding of gross misconduct by the Supreme Judicial Council. However, in this regard, it should be mentioned also that, though, the, though in the case of Justice Shahidur Rahman's removal from office, very recently decided by the Appellate Division, the Appellate Division held that he committed gross misconduct, as it was established that he had been secretly maintaining his previous law chamber through his junior, though the Supreme Judicial Council constituted for inquiry of the allegations against him did not reach such conclusion of gross misconduct as mandated under Art Sub Article 6 of Article 96. It only expressed the opinion that Justice Said Shahidur Rahman should not continue as an additional judge of the High Court Division of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh. It is submitted that, it's my submission, the finding of gross misconduct which was absent in the report of the Supreme Judicial Council, whether could be supplied by the Appellate Division will remain an important question for the future judiciary. Another issue needs to be mentioned here. What should be the standard of proof when any allegation of gross misconduct against a judge of the higher judiciary is brought? Our Appellate Division has tried to answer this in the following terms. It is to be borne in mind that in adjudicating a disciplinary proceedings against a judge of the highest court and holding trial of an offender in a criminal case, one cannot claim similar principle to be followed. For proving an offense against an offender, the prosecution must prove the offense against him beyond reasonable doubt. But this doctrine cannot be applicable in respect of a judge while hearing a disciplinary proceeding for removal of a judge on the ground of gross misconduct. In the alternative, it may be that an ordinary offender and a judge cannot be, it may be said that an ordinary offender and a judge cannot be equated at par while finding them guilty of the charges. However, the international threshold of misconduct capable of justifying removal of a judge from office is universally set 
at a very high level. And the basic standards are as follows. Incapacity or behavior that renders them unfit to discharge their duties, serious grounds of misconduct or incompetence. Now the criminal responsibility of judge. To safeguard judicial independence, judges should in principle be immune from criminal proceedings in relation to the content of their orders and judgments. However, the international standard contemplates that judges should remain liable for ordinary crimes not related to the content of their orders or judgments. Although as a safeguard against those against abuse of such proceedings, the permission of an independent authority such as a judicial council may be needed, may be obtained prior to such, prior to any charge or FIR. In Justice R. Viraswamy case, under the Indian jurisdiction, it was declared that the judges of the Supreme Court or High Court cannot be subjected to investigation in any criminal offense of corruption or a affair be registered against them without prior permission of the Chief Justice of India. Now the bodies to ensure accountability of judges. The Bangalore principles, the Bangalore implementation measures, and other international and regional standards and jurisprudence give importance to the need for establishing judicial accountability bodies which will be independent and impartial in order to safeguard the independence of individual judges and the judiciary as a whole. The bodies or mechanisms by which such accountability can be ensured include review of decisions through appeal or judicial review, judicial counsel, civil and criminal trials before the courts, parliamentary procedures, ad hoc tribunals, anti-corruption bodies, civil society monitoring and reporting, national human rights institutions, <coughs> professional associations of judges, international accountability mechanism. It should be borne in mind that the international and regional standards recognize that the exec executive should not have any role in regard to judicial removals or other forms of judicial discipline. Some of the above bodies are discussed here and after. Review of decisions through appeal or judicial review. Where a person has suffered damages as a result of a judicial decision, he should be able to hold the judge accountable through the mechanism of appeal and review to the higher court or where the decision is by the highest court through a review by the state court to reverse its earlier decision. Judicial councils. Independent judicial council is a very popular form of body by which a judge can be held accountable for his misconduct. And a study on the Commonwealth by the British Institute of International and Com Comparative Law titled The Appointment, Tenure, and Removal of Judges Under Commonwealth Principles, a Compendium and Analysis of Best Practice in 2015, found that 62.5% of the Commonwealth countries have disciplinary body meant for the judges, which is separate from both the executive and the legislature, which decides whether judges should be removed from office. As against which, the parliamentary form of removal of judges of the high judiciary has been found only in 34.3% countries. According to our known history, Justice Shahidun Rahman's case is probably the first and last case so far wherein a judge of the Supreme Court has been removed through the process of Supreme Judicial Council. However, in early 1979, two other judges, Justice Siddiq Ahmed Chaudhary and Justice Abdul Momit Chaudhary, were removed from office, probably through Supreme Judicial Council, as the state system was already in place at the relevant time by virtue of Second Proclamation, 10th Amendment Order 1976, which came into force on 1 12 1977. I've got the, this information from our Supreme Court annual report. However, there is an inherent shortcoming in such judicial council removal system, which is also prevalent in Bangladesh and Pakistan which is that the judge in question has, in fact, no right of appeal or review in such system. Nigeria is a rare example in a Commonwealth jurisdiction which allows appeals to be brought against certain decisions of the Judicial Council. The recent judgment of our appellate division in Sh Justice Shahidu Rahman's case has also confirmed that a judge of the High Judiciary in Bangladesh has a very limited scope of filing judicial review under the jurisdiction questioning legality of his removal on the basis of report of the Supreme Judicial Council. In the words of the Appellate Division, the High Court Division cannot sit over the opinion of the Council as an appellate forum or 
from the order of the President pursuant to the recommendation of the Council. It is submitted that the Appellate Division very conspicuously ignored the fact that the Supreme Judicial Council, in fact, did not recommend for removal of Justice Shahid Rahman or that it did not reach any conclusion that Justice Rahman committed gross misconduct, which is the basic jurisdictional fact for an order for removal by the President. According to the UN Special Report here on the independence of the judges and lawyers, such councils or bodies responsible for holding judges to account for judicial corruption and other wrongdoing should be composed either entirely or with a majority of judges with the possibility of additional minority representation of the legal profession or legal academics, but with the absolute exclusion of any representative of the political branches of the government, executive or legislature. Numerous other international and regional standards similarly refer to an independent body with a majority of judges who have been chosen democratically by other judges with no participation in disciplinary proceedings by any political authorities including the head of state, minister of justice or any other representative of the executive or legislative branches of the government. On the other hand, it has been stated that inclusion in the judicial council of persons who are not judges, while perhaps not essential, can add value perspectives from other stakeholders and help reassure the public of the independence and impartiality of the accountability of <coughs> process. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome our Secretary of the Bar. Thank you for coming. Now the parliamentary procedure. The requirement of parliamentary approval for removal of judges has a long history in some countries. However, many of these same standards also recognize that today the political character of parliamentary bodies itself creates a risk of abuse and that other mechanisms such as independent judicial council or disciplinary tribunals may more effectively secure judicial independence. For these reasons, some international standards oppose any substantive role of parliamentary procedure in deciding whether to remove judges. The difficulties in a parliamentary removal procedure became very much evident in the proceedings for removal of Justice V. Ramaswamy of the Supreme Court of India. He was appointed Chief Justice of High Court of Punjab, and there were certain allegations of financial impropriety and other irregularities against him. By the time of the inquiry against him, he had been elevated to the Supreme Court of India. Though he was found guilty by the Swanth Committee, three senior judges committee, as constituted by the parliament, 200 Loko Sabha members belonging to Congress Indira Party and its allies sabotaged the impeachment motion by remaining absent in the parliament session. Each of the 196 opposition MPs voted in favor of the motion, but still it could not secure two-third majority, and accordingly, the motion lapsed. Though Justice V. Ramaswamy subsequently resigned on the request of the Congress high ups, this case still remains as a glaring example of the failure of the parliamentary removal system. The impeachment proceedings against Justice Valla of India also failed as the BJP declined to support the motion because their leader L.K. Advani had been acquitted by him in the Babri Masjid demolition case. Now the monitoring by the civil society and the media. Civil society, including media, non-governmental organizations, bar associations, and other individual and institutional commentators should have the right to publicly report and comment on the work of individual judges and the judiciary as a whole, as an aspect of freedom of expression. Undue restrictions on civil society monitoring, reporting, and comment with the help of contempt of court proceedings against them is not desirable of a modern judiciary. As the UN Special Reporter on the Independence of Judges and Lawyers has pointed out, public scrutiny and comment on the work of judges through the media, civil society, and other commentators plays an invaluable role as a form of judicial accountability. The effective implementation of the Bangalore principles similarly affirm that legitimate public criticism of judicial performance is a means of ensuring accountability. And accordingly, a judge should generally avoid the use of criminal law and contempt proceedings to restrict such criticism of courts. Apart from above mentioned bodies, independent anti-corruption bodies, National Human Rights Commission, or institutions and professional association of judges may also make considerable contributions to ensure accountability of judges. There is no such international accountability mechanism in practice 
to ensure accountability of judges. Apart from trial of few judges at Nuremberg following World War II, there do not appear to have been any international criminal trials of judges for involvement in human rights violations or complicity in human rights violation, although judges can certainly, through exercise of their judicial powers, commit or be complicit in war crimes. For instance, willfully depriving a person protected by Geneva Conventions of their right to a fair trial or in crimes against humanity. Now, the procedural rights of the particular judge against whom action to be proceeded. Well, we are talking about judging a judge, it has to be kept in mind that a judge is also a human being and is a citizen of a particular country who has all civil liberties and rights as enshrined in the constitution or law like an ordinary citizen of that country. Since the judge holds a very unique position in the society and carries with him the prestige and dignity of the judiciary, international standards recognize that disciplinary or removal proceedings against a judge must include legal guarantees of procedural fairness and in actual practice be conducted in a manner that ensure that the procedure is fair. Such requirements of procedural fairness in favor of judge have been elaborated in great detail under Articles 10 and 11 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 14 of ICCPR, and in some other related standards and jurisprudence at the global, regional, and national level. The key elements in all types of judicial accountability proceedings include equality of arms, meaning the same procedural rights are to be provided to all parties unless distinctions are based on law and can be justified on objective and reasonable grounds, not entailing actual disadvantage or other unfairness to the defendant, and that each side be given the opportunity to contest all the arguments and evidence adduced by other party. This also implies that the judge has the right to know in advance the specific allegations of fact and law on which the case against him or her is based and access to and copies of any evidence. The right to legal assistance and representation by a lawyer or possibly another judge and adequate time to prepare defense. Expeditiousness, that is the, that the proceedings progressed against, progress without undue delay. Presumption of innocence and the right not to be compelled to testify against himself or to confess guilt. International standards also highlight the need for judges to have access to an appeal or independent review of decisions in disciplinary, suspension, or removal proceedings. Article 20 of the UN Basic Principles on the Independence of the Judiciary, for instance, provides as follows. Decisions in disciplinary, suspension, or removal proceedings should be subject to an independent review. Law Commission of India, in its 195th report on the Judges' Inquiry Bill 2005, has also recommended incorporation of such provision of appeal against removal order by the President or the orders of Judicial Council imposing minor measures in a complaint procedure. Accountability of judges in developing countries like Bangladesh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, India. Develop developing countries like Bangladesh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, or India have some inherent problems of their own regarding corruption, impunity, accountability of public officials and judges. Different branches of executive and judiciary of these countries normally suffer from corruption practice, which, is some which in some countries have become an acceptable culture. This has developed in the developing countries because of lack of transparency, lack of effective accountability measures, and the overwhelming practice of impunity. This widespread corruption and crime eventually result in the population accepting the corruption as part of the system and thus contribute to the distrust in the judicial system. Judges and judicial officials are not sufficiently qualified and they are, not, they are poorly paid. This phenomenon in developing countries directly causes human rights violations and undermines the rule of law. Such practice in the long term creates lack of public trust in the judiciary, thereby encouraging the people and some members of the law enforcing agency to take law in their own hands. Corruption in justice sector in developing countries normally take two forms. The first is the bribing of judges by private parties which may involve cash, land, goods, or services, including sexual services. And the second is political interference, usually involving pressure from executive or the legislature of legislative authorities to force judges to take decisions favorable, favorable to those in powers. In some countries, other forms of undue influence on judges also occur. Among the most extreme is when the lives and physical safety of judges and their family are directly threatened. This has been the case in Afghanistan, where judges are threatened 
and killed by the Taliban as per the UN Assistant Mission Report, Afghanistan 2015. In Pakistan, interference with judicial independence can be seen in both these forms, particularly in cases related to blasphemy. Blasphemy. Members of extreme religious groups use threats and intimidation to put pressure on judges to decide against the accused, even in the absence of any evidence supporting conviction. This phenomenon is also not totally absent in Bangladesh. Recent threat issued by some Islamic groups on the Bangladesh judiciary, while a writ petition relating to keeping of Islam as a state religion in the constitution was being heard by a special bench of the High Court Division, may be referred to as an example. Now, I'm concluding. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Justice Mahmoud al -Hawk. Therefore, with the above picture of developing countries in hand and a list of the international standards for effective implement implementation of anti-corruption measures against judges, time has come for Bangladesh as well as other developing countries to have a holistic new approach to, to the anti-corruption measures, in particular involving the judges of lower <coughs> and higher judiciary. Unless and until a message can be sent to the public at large and believed by the people that there is no practice of impunity in respect of corruption by judges, and until and until, unless judges themselves believe that they are not immune from accountability measures, the picture will remain the same. Thank you all, ladies and gentlemen. Has covered a number of areas which are relevant to the subject. First of all, he has Mr. Mr. Please, Hello. Want to question and answer the certainly, certainly, yeah. certainly. He has certainly referred to the various international conventions and declarations which uh, concern the uh, accountability of judges. He has also referred to the constitutional provisions in Bangladesh. He has referred to the experience of both Bangladesh as well as other jurisdictions with respect to. Uh, the particular instances where proceedings have been initiated for removal of judges on charges of gross misconduct. He has also referred very constructively to the limitations within the particular system. For instance, he has pointed out that the judges themselves are also citizens with certain rights and uh, with the same plethora of rights that any ordinary citizen of a country enjoys. And from that perspective, there are certain limitations within the systems that exist within the Constitution in terms of rights of appeal and rights of review. So from that perspective, this particular lecture has a plethora of uh, uh, references, resources, which any one of the individuals who are in attendance today, if you want to do further research in this topic, I'm sure that this particular lecture will be a very useful resource for you. This is a matter of great topical relevance. My Lord, Mr. Justice, Sheikh Hassan Arif referred to the experiences of uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. But I would also say that we have very recently seen the spectacle of the most powerful man in the world attacking a particular uh, judges in the United States of America for having given orders which are in restraint of travel bans. So this is an area topic which concerns not only Bangladesh, it is suppo I suppose it concerns all the other countries of the world. So uh, as Mr. Justice uh, Abdurrahman has requested, there should be a question answer session today. So uh, without further ado, may I invite members of the audience to uh, ask any questions that they may have, not only of Mr. Justice Sheikh Hassan Arif. We are very fortunate to have in attendance judges of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh, uh, including judges of the appellate division, uh, both present and former. Even during the course of lecture, we had two further judges of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh come in, Mr. Justice Kamal Islam Siddiqui and Mr. Justice Mahmudul Haq. As I previously pointed out, even before the lecture began, it was the lecture with the most number of judges in attendance, and that number has been <laughs> further increased during the course of the lecture. So without further ado, may I, may I invite members of the audience from? That process has to come through the legislature. 
But then there is again the other issue of judicial independence. And as you excellently pointed out, Bangalore principles and the other immersion principles saying that, you know, if you want this question, how do we best address that tension in our circumstances? What would be your an initiative has been taken. Well, I'm, I'm, I have been trying to avoid that issue because that's still pending because they have the division. Uh, initiative has been taken by the parliament to make it a parliamentary procedure dominated by parliament and parliament members. And a committee was proposed in that amendment to constitute a body uh, which was devoid of control of judiciary consisting of members who are outsiders. So, you all know that has been rejected by the High Division many times, and the issue is pending. Yes, very interesting point Justice Rafa Dhamit has made, that people who are the main stock stakeholders of the judiciary should also have a role to play. I would like to prefer a system where there should always be an inquiry on council, a body of body consisting of judges only, to inquire into the allegations of the judges. And then after such inquiry, and then that proposal of the commission may be, a proposal of the council may be placed before the parliament. So if that uh, procedure is adopted in our constitutional law, I think that will be a striking a balance between uh, elected representatives of parliament and non-elected judges. However, the concern I have expressed in V. Ramashami's case and in regards to that is always there. You know, parliament is a purely political body. So, uh, we, I also personally don't want a, uh, a judge commit, uh, committing after gross misconduct will escape through his lobbying of parliamentary members, or through his loyalty to a particular political party, as has happened in Vina Vashnav's case. He was loyal to Congress in Vina, and in the end, this party did not allow that motion to pass in Parliament. Though the independent judge's body found him guilty of gross misconduct. So there is always a, always the, this, this is a very, 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 uh, it is a very important and a very sensitive issue, I think, which to which uh, the at present, given the present political scenario of this country and present political character of the of the MPs of the parliament, and the very basic character of the main two of political parties, Awami and PMP, and the lack of internal democracy in those parties, I still don't believe that. Uh, this issue should be left to the parliament. Thank you. In Bangladesh, is very popular among them. Do you like to put the judges who cannot to judge a judge for their activity in the bench? Is that press is the is now recognized as the fourth pillar of the state. So under any circumstances, uh, press has a role to play in developing the judiciary or in every other branches of the state. Now the people have a right to know what the judge is doing. And it is the press or media through which people may know it. Because in a courtroom, we are not able to accommodate all the people of the country. In some countries like America and Australia, in some courts in Australia, they have allowed uh, the TV camera live broadcasting of court proceedings. Just to make sure that people are, well, are confident, to raise the confidence of the people about the performance of the judges, about the performance of the judicial uh, process. However, given the, uh, as I said, given the uh, situation, the standard of literacy in our country, and given the political culture of our country, which is yet to develop like those countries, uh, still it is very risky job to allow the media to uh, say whatever they like. That's why we always suggest through our judgments, we have always, Supreme Court has always suggested through their judgments, 
than superior mathematicians. That Miguel is allowed to criticize the judge, criticize the judgments, but in a very constructive way, not undermining the institution, not making the institution, not lowering the status of the institution in the eyes of the people, uh, in not uh, breaking the confidence of the people in the judiciary. Because judiciary is exercising the power not on the basis of law, though there are some legal support, legal basis for exercising the judiciary. Main basis of the judiciary by which judiciary functions is the confidence of the people. If that confidence is lost, if that respect to the judiciary is lost, everything is lost. No law can protect the judiciary. So media also should have the ability to criticize the judges, but there should be a balance. Always that um, criticism should be constructive criticism. Thank you. And that actually provides, I think, a very good guideline <coughs> which anybody who's interested in the subject can uh, uh, follow, particularly members of the media. It summarizes the uh, various judgments and the parameters within which the media should function. But that, of course, is another subject which I hope will be a subject matter for a lecture, uh, the concept of court and the way in which the jurisdiction is developed. Would there be any other questions? There. But still, since from different aspects, I have seen the different in order, uh, different aspect of the division has taken up, or will be taken up the issue very soon. Uh, so I, I will, I will myself try to avoid this issue. Uh, and I, I would expect that uh, the audience who are here, you are free to express your uh, opinion about that issue. Because one of the very important reactions of the Appellate in the Shredderum's case, very recently, to avoid issues, sitting judges, to avoid talking about the issues which is pending before the Appellate Division or the Appellate Division. Thank you. The person they feel uh, that should be taken account of is judges who are perhaps uh, either not competent, as in that we can see that they are losing it, if you put it in that slang context. Now, consider making incompetence an issue uh, for judges to be taken, which is the mandate of their post. Now, what is your view with regard to the Constitution requires for uh, um, the, the, the Constitution mandates only uh, gross misconduct or in the Indian Constitution as well in our Constitution as well for dealing with the judge who is not committing gross misconduct but somehow uh, in the judgments. Years together, he's keeping the judgments without signature. Uh, he is behaving rudely. We have been hearing this recently some judges are snoring openly uh, on the bench. But they're very uh, shortly advocated for having such provisions in the Constitution not to deal with only gross misconduct, but to deal with conduct or minor irregularities or minor. Like, and they can be admonished by the Supreme Judicial Council. They can be called in the situation to fix such behavior publicly. So I think this sort of measures should be included in our discipline. Sorry, sorry. Particularly. Just to add to that, judges of the subordinate judiciary are judged against those standards. Uh, by So there could be an extension of those standards to apply to the higher judiciary. That will be done also by the Chief Justice. Yes. Uh, I would like to. I would like to just thank you for curiosity. Either by way of judicial review or article 102, which is the basic feature of our constitution, which should not be negated. The basic feature of the constitution under article 102, judicial review, right of judicial review by every citizen for enforcement of fundamental rights should not be limited, irrespective of the position of the person, be he a judge, prime minister, fourth class employee, second class employee, whoever he is. He should have the right to challenge any sort of administrative decision. That's all. And, and you see, the, uh, uh, though I'm, I'm trying to avoid those issues in my discussions, but somehow they are coming up. Uh, in Shredderham's case, I'm not advocating for Shredderham, please don't think it that way. Whoever he is, even if he is a decoit, if he's a Serious criminal, he has the right to fair procedure, fair procedure, fair right. Supreme Judicial Council, 
the mandate under Article 196 is finding of gross misconduct. And Supreme Judicial Council concluded that the allegations against him have not said he committed gross misconduct. So the finding of gross misconduct, the authority of should not on the application. So the Supreme Judicial Council has said that he has not committed gross misconduct. Or he has not said anything about commission of gross misconduct. So it's still, um, the Federal Division's judgment is binding on everyone, particularly the Federal Division. Of course, uh, so this is the law of the land. If I like it, or don't like it. Thank you. <laughs> so why is all music always, always say, uh, judge, judge of the judges? You know, we cannot deny that. Because they are the ones who are immediately in front of the judges, watching everything, watching everything, and, and listening to everything, every gossip about the judges, they are the ones who listen to us. They are the ones who create gossip. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. And they, they also have the. Uh, this, if there is, if the provision of appeal will be inserted, then. Because you have traveled some uh, parliament, then media, then etc., etc. And he thought that no, nobody is qualified to judge the judges except me. He says, I don't think parliament is competent because they are not qualified, they are not, they don't know the law, yeah. the law. And moreover, history does not have a, that this should be left to them. And secondly, popular opinion, uh, he, he has not said so, but I infer that probably he is troubled with the judgment of those people who judge the fate of Socrates. He said, popular opinion is very dangerous. Socrates could not share the opinion of the people that starts and gods. That is his fault. And, but popular opinion uh, was uh, holding the field and he was punished uh, for treason. Anyway, so he says it is also dangerous. The others should not be. Secondly, there is a long standing demand that one should not be judged by any other, any other person other than his own peers. That is the demand of the, uh, what is that, Magna Carta. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one cannot be judged by any other person other than other his own peers. Yes. But only the paradox is, uh, that is the theory, that one should not be a judge in his own case. Therefore, judge is not the judge. The one that peers are to be judged. They are confusing this thing, that you are judging your no. The person who is guilty is not being judged. So the best way is to uh, improve the Supreme Judicial Council. And as you have pretty, pretty rightly said, that there are there human beings, that there should be a fleet forum. I, I suggest that there may be the whole appellate division may sit as an appellate forum in appropriate cases. Because there may be mistakes. And uh, so far, the inquiry is concerned, it is regulated by law that there, there should be asked yeah, what should be the subject matter, who will uh, the members of that committee have uh, procedural due process should be ensured. And that should not be the final thing, there should be an appellate authority consisting of the judges of the appellate division. And we have to be happy because it is said about the Privy Council, the Privy Council is final. Not because it, it is infallible, but it is it is infallible because it is final. So we should uh, should have the last faith in the institution, and not the the council itself. We should not be the, be the last say. There should be some. There may be many cases like say the Ramon, that the injustice as you are pointing out or suggesting that injustice has been done. We should not want that it should be repeated. Uh, and lastly, I, I I I thank you for your laborious research on the subject, extending much of the fields um, dominating the subject matter. And I hope you will do more research on the subject and help us. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, uh,